when a new quarter begins, usually the faculty preach. And the fact you have the faculty preaching because you're supposed to have model sermons. <laughs> now, yesterday we got that. But today uh, you won't get a model sermon. It's a, it's a different kind of presentation. I'm going to uh, focus on one theme and basically read a, a mixed salad of scripture passages and have a short application. So uh, not a well-delivered, uh, well-elaborated three-point sermon, uh, rather uh, a single theme. And for that theme, I'd like to turn in our Bibles to uh, a short passage from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 16. And the text is simply the ninth commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16 reads, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask in Jesus' name that you would apply your word to our hearts and our minds, that you would speak to us even this day as we pray in that powerful and precious name. Amen. Amen. This is a theme that I preach on every three years. The faculty's heard uh, this sermon in 2012, 2014, 2016, and now in 2019. And I want to cover this theme uh, for every class when possible. So it's not a well-developed sermon. It's more an exegesis of one passage. The ninth commandment is uh, one of the ten. And uh, for us in the seminary is a very important uh, passage that I'd like to apply to our hearts. But all sermons have a biographical background. Uh, I think that uh, Pastor York yesterday wants us to think about fasting. He yearns for us uh, to be more pious in our uh, zeal for the things of the Lord. And uh, this sermon has a biographical background aspect to it as well. Back in the 1980s, I was teaching at a seminary in Philadelphia, and we were involved in a major theological conflict. It was one uh, that went through the faculty as well as the presbytery, and the documents relative to that theological conflict consisted of hundreds of pages of testimony and uh, theological writings. And it was a very difficult time theologically and emotionally for everyone involved. And I don't want to speak about that controversy. Uh, that's not the issue. But what I want to address are actions that occurred during that controversy in the 80s that, uh, uh, that I've reflected upon and have developed this sermonic theme that I want to give to you as seminarians. During those days of controversy, certain words were said, certain words were written that probably should not have been said nor written. And had all the different participants in the controversy really paid attention to the Ninth Commandment, I don't think the controversy would have had a different ending, but there would have been fewer broken hearts so let's take a look at what it means for a seminary to follow the Ninth Commandment. Theological controversy, theological debate, and interpersonal debate and controversy is part of life in the church. And uh, that we disagree, even in a small seminary, and different uh, issues, say, among students and faculty, um, that's a normal part of interaction. But what I'd like us to uh, do is to develop a policy, a policy here at RPTS that will embody while we're students here and then take that same policy into our congregations. So let's talk about a policy that flows from the Ninth Commandment. And again, today's sermon will basically be an exposition of the larger catechism. I'm going to literally read the larger catechism and look at some of the uh, proof texts from it. 
But I want to speak a policy uh, about this policy this way. I want all of us to covenant with each other to speak words about each other that are true and honest and loving. I want us to avoid words uh, concerning each other that don't protect the good name of each other. So uh, let me read uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism at question and answer 144 and understand what the divines say and then elaborate the policy. So let's take a look at Westminster Larger Catechism on the Ninth Commandment and I'll simply read, read it. What are the duties required in the Ninth Commandment? The answer is, now if you've got the Larger Catechism memorized, uh, Dr. O'Neill will give you a special sticker on your forehead, <laughs> not, just the, not just the shorter, this is the larger. The duties required in the Ninth Commandment are the preserving and promoting of truth between man and man and the good name of our neighbor as well as our own, appearing and standing for the truth and from the heart, sincerely, freely, clearly, and fully, speaking the truth and only the truth in matters of judgment and justice, and in all other things whatsoever, a charitable esteem of our neighbors, loving, desiring, and rejoicing in their good name, sorrowing for and covering of their infirmities, freely acknowledging of their gifts and graces, defending their innocency, a ready receiving of a good report, and unwillingness to admit of an evil report concerning them discouraging talebearers, flatterers, and slanderers, love and care of our own good name and defending it when need requireth, keeping of lawful promises, studying and practicing of whatsoever things are true, honest, lovely, and of good report. So that ends uh, what the divines said about our short text from Exodus. And if you have your larger catechism on some of you, I, I see you looking on phones, you'll see that there are 24 proof texts added to uh, this analysis of the ninth commandment. And we're going to take a look at some of those texts and elaborate uh, some of the duties. But let me tell you the policy before I elaborate uh, what the Westminster larger catechism says. The policy is this. So if a student ever comes to me and has a tale about one of my colleagues, one of the seminary colleagues, and it's an unpleasant tale. It's uh, something that is not uh, positive about the colleague. The policy will be that I will stop you in mid-sentence, and then I will take you physically to that colleague's office, and then I will ask you to continue your tale in his physical presence. And uh, so that's a rule that I've established at the uh, seminaries where I've taught since that one in Philadelphia. And uh, in fact, I want to tell you that the policy works. I taught in a seminary right before being here that had a faculty of 20. And uh, that faculty was at that time fairly contentious. Uh, uh, there was strife among that faculty, and one of the reasons that I was invited to teach there was because the professor of systematic the theology had just quit. Uh, so there was uh, tension in those days, and I gave this sermon in chapel, and it was in the first year that a student came with the story about a faculty colleague, and we did the policy. And I stopped him in mid-sentence, we went over to the other colleague's office, and he got about halfway through and decided not to continue. And uh, so I want to let you know that it works. Um, it's a, a good way to protect and preserve the good name uh, for me as a faculty colleague. But of course, I want you to covenant with each other to uh, protect and preserve each other's good names as well. So that's a, 
again, a more directive policy uh, that I try to present to the students every three years. Now let's take a, uh, let's turn back to the larger catechism and observe the duties that the divines thought were required in the ninth commandment. The preserving and promoting of truth between man and man. The preserving and promoting of truth between man and man. Now sometimes we do things that are wrong and uh, uh, the issue is preserving and promoting truth. So uh, deciding when something is true and when something is false is a difficult thing. So we want to work hard to promote truth between man and man. In Zechariah 8.16 we read, these are the things you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. The divines all also said that the ninth commandment requires appearing and standing for the truth. In Proverbs 31 verses 8 and 9 we read this, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. So we stand for the truth when uh, someone who is poor or needy is being attacked. And that would be uh, the person that you're speaking about is poor or needy, at least in, uh, as you are saying those evil reports about them. We stand for the truth in all things whatsoever. And they tell us to read Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Again, we protect and preserve all the parts of our body and as seeing ourselves as members of one body. So this policy, I think, should be easy for us to enact. Furthermore, we're told that it means to have a charitable esteem of our neighbors. A charitable esteem of our neighbors. And they tell us to look at Hebrews 6, 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. So the Hebrews were being chided, uh, but they hoped for better things. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So we love our neighbor and have then what the divines call a charitable or loving esteem for them. Connected is loving, desiring, and rejoicing in their good name. Loving their good name, desiring their good name, and rejoicing in it. Romans 1.8 tells us, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Here Paul is rejoicing in the good name of the community in Rome. But they remind us of 2 John 1.4 as well. There John says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth just as we were commanded by the Father. For I rejoiced greatly when they testified to your truth, or that you're walking in the truth. A different translation of verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. The ESV says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the, tr in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. What is your great joy? Your joy should be to hear not the evil report, but the good report of your neighbor. And likewise, we are to sorrow for their infirmities. Not one among us is free of infirmity. The counselors tell us that we are broken reeds ministering to other broken reeds, and that's true. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 2, verse 4. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. You know the Corinthians. They were an outstanding congregation, right? And Paul, uh, Paul doesn't want to cause them pain, but he wants to demonstrate his love for these broken reeds. So we sorrow for the infirmities that we hear about others. In fact, the divines say we cover their infirmities. We cover their infirmities. We, we don't proclaim their infirmities. We protect their infirmities by covering them. Proverbs 17, 9 tells us, whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Turning to the New Testament, Peter tells us, 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Furthermore, the divines tell us that we are to defend their innocency, to defend their innocency. 1 Samuel 22, 14, then Ahimelech answered the king, and who among all your servants is so faithful as David, who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? So we defend the innocency of that party that is being spoken of. We don't want to hear the charge. And that takes us to their sixth application, an unwillingness to admit of an evil report concerning them. This is the action part, the unwillingness to admit of an evil report concerning them. That's where you stop the person in mid-sentence and you say that you're, you don't want to hear this story. And we read about that in Psalm 15. We sang Psalm 15 just a minute ago. Who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend? And uh, the, uh, the divines in the larger catechism verse, excuse me, question 145, talks about receiving and countenancing evil reports. So in Proverbs 29, 12, to, uh, uh, to almost conclude, if a ruler listens to falsehood, all his officials will be wicked. So the divines close by telling us that we should discourage talebearers, citing Proverbs 25, 23, the north wind brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue, angry looks. As we look at both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see the same story of the body of Christ acting to protect itself. And the ninth commandment was instituted by God for the blessing of the church of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Proverbs says in Proverbs 19 verses five through nine. A false witness will not go unpunished. And he who breathes out lies will not escape. Many seek the favor of a generous man and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. All a poor man's brothers hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursues them with words, but does not have them. Whoever gets sense loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will discover good. A false witness will not go unpunished and he who breathes out lies will perish. So brothers and sisters, this policy is one that is easy for us to pursue here at RPTS. As a matter of fact, I'm bringing this up not because I perceive a problem, it's to keep a problem from raising its ugly head. I saw Dr. Scipione come in, so I feel free to, to cite him in, in the sermon. When 
we first uh, met Dr. Scipioni coming from other seminaries said, said to a number of us in the faculty, you know what's surprising about this faculty? They actually love each other. Um, so uh, we, uh, we do practice uh, love for each other uh, here at RPTS among the faculty and, and in the student body as well. But if we follow this policy here, then I want you to take it with you into the pastorate. I want you to covenant with the elders as you meet around the table to look each one of the elders in the eye and let him know that you will protect and preserve his good name, not only in the elder meeting room, but in the congregation as well. And I promise you that this kind of covenanting among elders produces a freedom in the session where, where you're actually free to disagree with each other and to know that those disagreements will not be used to be a cause of slander in the congregation itself. So here at RPTS, let's follow the ninth commandment. Follow the commands of God in general. And for the glory of the Church of Jesus Christ, take it from here into our pastoral ministries. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Your word is at times sharp and at many times difficult uh, in which to walk. We ask, O oh Lord, that we as your people might walk in the light and not turn to darkness. Bless us in this and give us the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close by singing Psalm 101, Selection B.